Yeah, you know, most people go to church, and, uh, and we might sing, we might not. At least as many people sing as don't, or at least as many people don't sing as do. Um, but if you really want to see worship, go to Michigan State, or go to U of M, or go to Ohio State, or go to Penn State, or go to a football game on a Saturday afternoon on a college campus and watch 105,000 people who all know the drill. It's liturgy. You walk in, you got music, you got a band, there's formations. You know, the people sit down, they stand up, they scream, they raise their hands, they do the wave, they do all these things, huh? They get it. They understand what's going on here, and they're there not to simply watch. They're there to throw themselves into it. And oftentimes, they act like absolute idiots in the process. You know, I'll paint my face blue and gold, or green and white, or scarlet and gray, and have no qualms about that. You know, and be on national TV and do all these silly things that people do, holding up signs and we're number one and all that kind of stuff. Huh? They're involved in the game because they think it's worthwhile. And then we show up for the creator of the universe who has destroyed death made it possible for me to live forever, washed away all my sins, given me a chance to start over, over and over and over and over again. And we're like, oh, yeah, you know, uh, okay. And, and we're not involved. But worship happens, unfortunately, in places where it shouldn't happen. Nothing wrong with going to a football game but we shouldn't worship 11 men running around the field. They don't do anything for you. They give you a momentary, fleeting feeling of diversion. Today, life is good. Michigan won, or Michigan State won, or whoever won. But every day, life is good, because my life's in God's hands, and he loves me, and he has a plan for me. And what could I possibly give back to God for all that God has given me? So if I, if I somehow can understand that it's worth throwing my, my voice and singing loud and being involved and, and being attentive to something as trivial as a game or a concert or whatever the case might be, I should be able to understand from that experience how much more God is deserving of everything. Yeah, how pathetic, right? You know, here, here, objectively speaking, it is all this and so much more. It's beyond description, huh? what's really happening there. If you and I could see what heaven looks like right now, we would be on our face. You know, if we could see the angels in adoration, we would just be shocked. But our experience of this is less than overwhelming. Why? The air might have gone out in church. Kids might be crying. The priest might have given a really pathetic sermon. The music might be bad. I'm filled with distractions from my daily life. I'm thinking about, okay, mom and dad are coming over at four. We've got to pick up the kids from the soccer game at three. I'm never going to have a chance to make dinner. Where are we going to get it? In? And boom, you've lost everything. You know, it's so easy to tune out. And because, it's, because it has a ritualized structure to it, we know all the parts without thinking. And so we can just say the words, and yet my mind is on when am I going to get the kids, or who's going to pick up dinner, or oh, no, my Aunt Julie's coming over, and that's going to be awkward. I mean, whatever the case might be, you know? So we have to do everything we can, first of all, to learn. Like, I have to take some initiative there is no excuse for anybody in this age with all of the things that we have available to us online to not know what's going on or to not understand something. But, but I only make the effort to understand something that I think is worth it. The tragedy is we don't think that there's really anything worth getting out of Mass because there's no reason not to go look. It's all right there. There's thousands and thousands of books or talks that I can listen to or little things that I can read online or videos I can watch on YouTube or whatever the case might be. 
and I'll, I'll go watch something that I know will pay off for my life. But instead, many of us, we don't take the time to, to learn or to educate ourselves as to what's going on here. So I, f I have to take an initiative first. And then I have to do everything I can to tune out all distractions before I come to Mass. So like a, a good question to ask ourselves is, what am I doing on the way to church? You know, am I listening to the radio? Is that really what I should be doing? I don't know about you, but it takes me a while to actually begin to get quiet. So there's no way I can walk into something where somebody significant is going to speak to me and not be prepared. If you were going in for an interview today, you would probably collect yourself before you sat down with the person, right? You know, if St. Augustine used to use this image. If, if you were in line, and at the end of the line was the king, and he was handing out jewels to people who could make some sort of uh, uh, convincing argument as to why they should receive some, you would be sitting there trying to come up with a good reason as to why you should receive some of these emeralds or rubies or diamonds. Huh? You wouldn't just go, well, I hope I get the words when I get there. You would plan and prepare. We have to do the same thing when we come to Mass. I've got to tune out distractions. You know, there is little silence in most of our lives. We are distracted beyond measure. We've got smartphones and we're always in touch. And, and as a result of that, the mind is always doing this. And if it's always doing that, it's hard to hear. And God does not speak um, like a train whistle. God whispers, usually. And if I'm not accustomed to being used to silence and to listening for his voice, I'm not going to hear it. And if I don't hear it, then I'm going to miss what life's all about. So I have to make the effort to learn, and I've got to make the effort to be attentive when I come here. For example, the readings. Everybody in the world should know what readings are going to be said at Mass. It's not like, you know, I wake up that morning and go, I think I'm going to do Hebrews 3. You know, we follow a lectionary, and all the readings are posted online for the whole world to see. You know, you ever gone to Mass and you hear the priest give a homily and you go, I think he just saw those readings for the first time right now. Because <laughs> what he said was just like that. So just like you would be upset with a priest who hadn't prayerfully prepared for Mass and to preach, so you should hold yourself to the same thing. You should read the readings throughout the week and be prepared for Sunday because because what we're reading in the newspapers and what we're reading on, uh, on our smartphones and what I'm seeing on TV is not in sync with what the Word of God says. So no wonder that the Scriptures are proclaimed and we're like, whoa, you've got to be kidding, love my enemies? Pray for those who persecute me? You're out of your mind. The world says, kill those who persecute you. So I have to make the reading of the Word of God a part of my daily life. And if you don't know what to read, we'll start reading the scriptures for the Sunday coming up so that, again, you're ready for them so that whether I say or whoever the priest or deacon or bishop preaches says something that gets you, the Lord, who's the only one we really need to hear from, will get you because you're familiar with his Word. You've been preparing for it all week. And now when you sit down in this assembly, which the Father has gathered together, you're ready to hear him speak. So it was very clear to me in my life at a certain point when I was uh, 25 or so that God was inviting me to serve him as a priest. That was abundantly clear. So I went to seminary. Um, as I'm going through seminary, I have great desires for lots of things as a priest, especially to preach and teach and, uh, and do a whole set of things that I felt like the Lord was really asking me to do. Um, the Mass was beyond boring to me. This is in the seminary. So I can remember probably uh, November of the year I was ordained. So I was ordained in May of 1996. 
somewhere around Thanksgiving, Christmas time of that year. I remember sitting in the chapel in the seminary, mindful that I'm now, I'm already a deacon, I'm six months from being a priest. And I said something as, as blunt as this. I just said, um, Lord, I don't really enjoy coming to Mass. And I'm going to be doing this at least once a day for the rest of my life. So you have to do something. So help. I don't get it. You know, I'm, I'm fine with going and all that, but it doesn't do much for me. So that January, it was my last semester in seminary, I had uh, among, among the classes that I had, I had a class taught by a guy named Father Jeremy Driscoll, who splits his time between Mount Angel Abbey in Oregon and Rome, which is where I was. And he taught a class on um, the relationship, sounds kind of technical, the relationship between fundamental theology and liturgy. What's that mean? It means um, a look at how God makes himself known in the Mass. And uh, the book, What Happens at Mass, is a shortened, condensed version of that class, which is as great a book as I know to give to anybody in the Mass. Well, I ran every day from his class to the chapel to go pray because it just opened my eyes. It was like, a, it was kind of like someone used the image once of going to the ocean every day and you're looking at the ocean and you're sitting on the beach and you're just kind of captivated by the roar of the waters and the majesty and the beauty and whatnot. And then someday somebody gives you a mask and you actually go into the ocean. And it hasn't taken away from anything, but now you're like, oh my gosh, I had no idea these things were in here. That's kind of how that class was to me. It's like God just dropped scales off my eyes and I got to see it and since then it's, it just continues to grow I hope anyway point being for all of us um, there's nothing wrong with going to God like a beggar and saying Lord I don't get this you have to do something but if I come to God with that kind of a desire if you come to God with that kind of a desire then you can bank on him doing something you know, we pray like beggars before him. Lord, I don't get this. That's how the saints prayed. I don't get it. We're sitting there saying all these little pious words that we think, please God, don't waste time. Tell him what's on your heart. He can read it anyway. I don't get it. I don't understand what happens at Mass. I'm bored. Say it to him. And then ask him for help. And then go do the work. You know, read something, listen to something, watch something. Pray. You know, just say, Lord, help me understand what's happening right now. And he will. Might not come like that, but he will. Jesus says, if you who are wicked know how to give good gifts to your children, then how much more will your Heavenly Father give good gifts to you? Yeah, the Holy Father says something along the lines, I can't remember the exact quote, but the gist of it is, it's a tragedy to get used to what is magnificent. There's nothing more magnificent than the Mass. No. That's objectively speaking. Subjectively speaking, most people don't wake up in the middle of the night or early on Sunday morning and go, oh, I can't wait to go to Mass. So the subject of experience of the Mass in general and the Eucharist in particular being the source and the summit of our life is not what it should be. But objectively speaking, first of all, let's just take that level. Objectively speaking, nothing is more magnificent than what happens when you come to Mass. Why? Well, because first of all, you're in heaven. Ponder that. There's only one Mass. It happens in heaven. And at the one Mass, the whole church is gathered together. They're all gathered around the Lord's throne in worship and adoration and thanksgiving and praise. So all the saints in heaven, all the angels in heaven, all the souls in purgatory, the whole faithful on earth, even if it's only you, me, and half a dozen people in a small little chapel on a Tuesday in June, even if that's all we can see, the reality is, the whole church is there. So when I walk into church, 
I am surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. That's where I am. I am before God's throne. So my first pastor used to say that because of the fact that there's only one Mass, when the Eucharist is held up at Mass, it becomes something like a two-way mirror. And we see what looks like bread, but it's not. It's the Lord. And on the other side, all those that we love, all those that the Lord has taken from our sight, all those who are already home, they see the Lord. And our glance meets, which is a really comforting thought, especially for those of us who've lost loved ones. So that's the first part of the magnificence. I'm in heaven. I'm reminded how this all finishes. You know, so life here is a series of ups and downs, huh? The Psalms tells us it's a, a valley of tears, huh? or the valley of the shadow of death. It's not trying to deny that. Life here is often like walking through the valley of the shadow of death. This is hard, this life. But when I come to Mass, I get a glimpse of the end. I'm reminded of the reality that God wins. The last word is His. This is all going somewhere. You and I are not subject to fate. We're not just thrown into existence. We haven't evolved out of the slime to no purpose. You and I are breathing right now because the one who hung the stars in the sky is in love with us. So he's willed us into being, and he has a plan for us. And that plan, while this life here is very important because it's going to determine where we're going to spend eternity, the plan is that you and I would be divinized. That's the plan. Peter writes in his second letter, huh? that God has made us and we are destined to partake of his own divine nature. You are going to be divinized. You're not going to dissolve into like a blob of Godhead or something. You will, as you are, um, but as you were perfectly intended to be, share in God's own life for all eternity. Who's God? God is absolutely, perfectly joyful perfectly happy. He's never bored. He's pure love. That's what you're made for. Infinite joy, infinite happiness, infinite love. And when you and I come to Mass, we actually um, do what we were intended to do for all eternity, objectively speaking, as best we can here, meaning we get divinized because we actually take God under the appearance of bread and wine and consume him, which is either true or it's really stupid. <laughs> if it's true, if God is so in love with us that he doesn't just tell that to you. You know, you're a married woman, huh? So anybody who, anybody who loves anybody else huh, knows that it's never enough just to say, I love you. That's why we give gifts. You know, I'm looking for some way to tangibly show that to you, right? Why do we do that? Because we know that words alone are not enough. We have this built-in need to give. So we give rings, we have cards, we give flowers, we give ice cream, we give chocolate. And we give ourselves. Huh? Husband and wife give themselves to each other. God is not content to merely tell us that he loves us. Because he has made us the way he's made us. So he gives himself to us. And two become one flesh in the Eucharist. That is magnificent. Who would do that? How could it be that God could so love you or me that his desire is for us to share his own life? but it is. Well, what else is magnificent in the Mass, huh? Well, it's important to understand that the Mass is, um, is not a retelling of something. 
Um, it's the representation of something, meaning it's actually becoming present now in a sacramental way. Just to be clear, huh? Jesus was crucified once and for all. Okay, We don't crucify Jesus over and over again at the Mass. He's died, risen, he's triumphant in heaven and glory. But what happens when you and I come to Mass is the event of the Last Supper, of Calvary, uh, of his burial, of his resurrection, of his ascension, all of that you and I become a contemporary of. So for me, the, the uh, like a vernacular image of that for you has always been to me something like Saving Private Ryan. So this very dramatic movie of, uh, of an old man is how the movie starts, who goes to the cemetery at Normandy because he had been involved in D-Day. And so he was there that day on June 6th. He goes back with his family on uh, some day in the present time to visit Normandy. And he stands at a certain point, he's kind of shuffling through the cemetery and he gets to one grave in particular and he stops. And the grave is, the headstone is a cross. And he stops and he looks at it and he reads a name and the name is Captain Miller. Well, Captain Miller was the man who rescued him and saved his life. And the movie goes into a flashback. So for the next two and a half hours, you're in a flashback back in World War II in uh, France and the surrounding areas. And it starts with him in this time, and then the camera kind of zooms into his eye, and then it pulls back out, and boom, it's 1944. And you go through all the travails of this man being rescued and the ending of the flashback is this man, Captain Miller, dying. And he grabs Private Ryan as he's dying. As, and he whispers in his ear and he says, earn this. And Ryan says, what? And he says, earn it. And then he dies. And then the camera kind of zooms into his eye again. And it pulls back out and it's present time. And here he is standing at the grave. And he's looking at a cross. And he says, to the cross, something along the lines of, uh, I've brought my family here with me today. And I wasn't sure how I would feel coming back here. I think about what you said to me that day, every day of my life. I hope that I have done what you men did for me or measured up to what you men did for me. In other words, here's a man talking to a cross, acknowledging I am alive because you died for me. That's a great image to me for what happens in the Mass, except what happens in the Mass is more magnificent than that, because that was a flashback. What happens in the Mass is not a flashback. You and I are there. Even though we can't see it, were there. The Lord gathers us around the table in the upper room. We are present at the foot of the cross where the wounds of Christ are still fresh. We're there at the empty tomb and the joy of the apostles and Mary Magdalene and all those who went to the tomb who saw it empty. We're there on the day of the ascension and we're up in heaven. All of that is a contemporary experience for you and me which is why the Mass ends with, in Latin it used to be ite misa est, huh? she is sent. In other words, you've just seen the only thing that really matters. God so cares for you that he has become man for you, taken on our greatest foe, death, and crushed it. Taken on sin and crushed it taken on hell and crushed it. That's the only thing that gives you and me any hope whatsoever. Otherwise, we're just rearranging deck chairs in the Titanic as the ship goes down. But the ship is not going down. Huh? God loves the world. That's why he made it. That's why he became one of us. That's why he's redeemed it. But the world that you and I are living in doesn't know that. And so you and I, who are here at this event, which I have to first of all realize is an event, which is happening now. Now I'm here, the Lord is speaking to me, if I will listen and know that he wants to speak to me. 
And then he drives me out or sends me out into the world in which I live, my family, my coworkers, my friends, the people I shop with, who I play golf with, whatever, and tell them about him and what he's done for me. You're not worthy of this. That's why it's a gift, right? All is gift. It's all grace. Who could be worthy of this? I mean, who in the right mind would stand up and say, I think I was worth God becoming man and getting slaughtered for me? Not a chance. But it's a gift, you know? So what do you do with a gift? You receive it. But then you have to do something with it, right? You know, if, if Private Ryan, at 85 years old, had gone back to Captain Miller's grave and looked at the cross and went, ha, better you than me. We would have all gone, I don't think that's the right reaction to a man who died so that you could survive the war and get married and have a child and grandchildren and go on to live a productive life. Everybody would recognize immediately that's not a very human response. But I'm afraid we do that often to the cross. Not the cross of Captain Miller, the cross of Jesus Christ. We just go, yeah, thanks, you know, and we're back on our way. There's a great statue in the Holy Land of uh, St. Peter. So when Peter is first called by the Lord, this experience of not being worthy is very tangible to Peter. So Peter's out fishing, and they catch nothing, and Jesus goes out with them, and they catch this incredible number of fish. Uh, and this man who, whose life is fishing realizes this does not happen and so he turns and looks at the Lord, and the Lord must have had this, you know, expression on his face, like, pretty good, huh? <laughs> you know, and, and obviously, like, he knew what was going to happen. And, and Peter, aware of the presence that he's in, somehow, whatever he's aware of, he knows this is not a normal experience. And Peter falls to his knees and looks at, Peter, and looks at Jesus and says, depart from me, Lord. I am a sinful man which is our experience of coming into contact with the holy. It's like, whoa, uh, you don't know me. You can't possibly be looking for someone like me. You don't know what I've done. But God knows everything I've done. And so the statue, which is in Galilee, is of Peter on his knees with a shepherd's staff in his hand, and he's just falling backwards as if to say, I can't do this. And Jesus is standing over Peter, and he has his hand over his head, and all the energy is going forward, as if to say, yes, you can. But it has anything to do with you. It has everything to do with me. I know for me, I, for years, especially when I was in the seminary, I kept thinking, there's no way I can do this. And, uh, and how could it be that I, who have done all that I have done in my life, which is pretty vile, could be asked to do this. And finally, one day, I remember praying in the chapel, and I just, I could just hear the Lord say, if I call you son, then who are you to tell me that you're not worthy of that? Of course you're not worthy of it. That's why it's a gift. You have to receive it. So stop protesting and just receive it. And so the Lord to all the rest of us, this is my gift to you. I give you your identity. You are my beloved son or daughter, not because of what you have or haven't done, just because I've made you. Now go live accordingly.